it was great that they came in and spoke to me just like a person. You know, I wasn't a victim and it helped me to never think of myself as a victim. Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 93 of the Stroke Cast. Vince Holland was a healthy, athletic 30 something year old when he suddenly found himself on the kitchen floor at his parents' home on a holiday weekend. He just had a stroke, and in a story many of us have already lived, his life changed in an instant. Vince would go on to pursue his recovery and launch his own social media campaign to raise stroke awareness and support survivors. And it's through that that, that we connected. It's, it's all about our mutual presence on Instagram. So let's get right to it and meet Vince Holland. So Vince, thank you so much for joining us on StrokeCast this week. Yeah, Bill, thanks so much for having me. <laughs> I mean, this is one of those things that's really sort of been a testament to sort of the power of social media is that I'm 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 finding more and more people to connect with through Twitter and Instagram and these other platforms. So that's something we'll we'll be able to talk about later. But I think I I mean that's just a great place to go ahead and reach out with other survivors. It is. It's really been awesome uh, how that's worked out. There are so many ways that you could use social media and to uh, just use that utility to actually connect with other people around something that could otherwise be pretty isolating is is awesome. What was your life like before your stroke? Uh, I was pretty active. Like um, I've done sports since I was probably seven or eight years old. Around the time of my stroke, I was a member of a gym and kind of working two jobs and doing a lot of things and maybe kind of burning the, the candle at both ends, so to speak. Um, but I was definitely super active, which is part of why it was so surprising for me to have a stroke. I was active and young. Um, I was competing in like a CrossFit style competition occasionally, even doing uh, the Olympic weightlifting uh, style competitions. Just a very active lifestyle. That's one of the things that's so important to keep in mind is that we talk about a lot of the most frequent risk factors for stroke include you know, things like smoking and high blood pressure and obesity and diabetes. And yeah, you can go ahead and reduce your chances of stroke by taking care of those things, but that doesn't eliminate it completely. Right. And so that was one of the things they're looking at. Like, you know, do you lead a sedentary lifestyle? I'm like, no, absolutely not. It's like the complete opposite direction for me. And to just see that it could just come out of nowhere. So when it came out of nowhere, I mean, what happened that day? Uh, apart from the stroke, it was normal 4th of July, like got a chance to hang out with my friends. We saw fireworks that day, got to have dinner together. And then at the end of the night, I was at my parents' house, actually. Everything felt normal until my legs sort of felt like they were filled with static. Everything is kind of just like the sensations in my legs were getting way soft. And I tried to stand up and they basically disappeared. It was just a weird sensation. Like I looked across the room and my brother was there and he's a, a corpsman in the Navy. So he kind of put me through the, the fast protocol, you know, he, mm -hmm. he's asking me to, to, to smile and checking my responses. And he sort of knew, I mean, he sort of knew what was going on and I could tell, uh, but he tried not to be too anxious about it. That that's some great training coming through right there. So, so that was happening. So uh, presumably they called 911 and got you to the hospital. Yeah, and that was the great thing is that it was I was able to get to the hospital within an hour of that happening. And they say that was one of the saving graces was that I was so close to a hospital already. I got there to the first um, the first emergency room that I would be in. And that's where they administered the TPA and identified that it was an ischemic stroke. And uh, I think that probably saved me from a much more uh, treacherous road to recovery and possibly my life makes such a big difference when they can get that administered quickly and and take care of that as you're going going through all that did they figure out what caused it or is it still just categorized as cryptogenic yeah it's been like just that cryptogenic category you know they looked at all the, the things that they could maybe the structure of my heart even doing like the tee uh the doppler mm -hmm. of course they do a full battery of toxicology test to make sure that you're not on anything illicit and that this is not a result of something else like that mm -hmm. And of course, all of those things come back with no clear signs that should lead to a stroke in a 28-year-old active adult. 
Right. Absolutely. And and I think that's one of those things, too, that's really valuable about calling 911 or 999 in other parts of the world in getting the ambulance to take you there is that with a lot of younger folks who look healthy, if you just show up at the ER, I mean, I hear stories of them just deprioritizing uh, the younger folks who show up because they just assume they're drunk or, or on drugs. And it's, it's really frustrating that that can happen. But when you go in an ambulance, they're already doing the triage in the ambulance. Right. Yeah. And that's one of the scary things is to hear there are so many survivors who go through these horror stories of, yes, just being misdiagnosed or written off as just having a migraine or some other experience. And it turns out to be a stroke. And then by the time they figure it out, they've missed that TPA window. Right. A very vital window. Yeah. So so after going through all that, what does your life look like today? I'm active again, not nearly to the same degree. I'm just doing things now to try and stay on top of like my health and wellness. And that that means my physical health, my emotional, my spiritual health, my social health too. But I am active again and kind of regaining a big sense of independence. And along the way to that, uh, that includes getting back to work full time, which was huge. And I can drive. So that was a pretty wild milestone to get back to was having to relearn to drive as an adult who had done that as a teenager. Were you able to then cover full practical use of your legs and, and arms and hands? Yep, I am pretty much, I can do everything about as well as I could before. Like when I'm at the gym and I have to perform, I can tell where some of the upper thresholds of my performance were. I'm not quite there, but I'm very close. I've just been really, really blessed in that way. Rehab was amazing for that physically, but also for mental rehabilitation. Like that was a huge piece of being in an inpatient facility in a community of people who are also uh, enduring something. So what was that rehab experience like? I'm definitely grateful for it because, like I said, it's a community of people, a community of sufferers, sort of. So you bond over the fact that you're there for a reason uh, and you do get a sense that you belong. You know, everyone's there for something different. But when people look to you and kind of want to know, so what are you in for? They just want to know how you fit. You know, you're not quite as isolated as you would be if you had to try and pursue recovery on your own or uh, you get around people um, who are interested and what it is that brought you there. And you you get time to think about yourself. You get to reflect on your sense of identity and what it is you lost and to try and process, honestly, grieving for yourself. Yeah, and the other thing that I think is probably really important too is that, as you said, you're working two jobs, you were super active. Uh, When you're going to rehab, suddenly all uh, all that other stuff of life just sort of stops and you, right. you get a chance to start of start focusing on just in the moment. Absolutely. Your priorities definitely shift because when you get to rehab, the things that people focus on are not a lot of the superficial things that take up so much of your time when you're just kind of ripping and running on the day to day. Nobody asks, like, what's your top lift at in the gym? And no one really wants to know how many followers you have on social media. They don't ask you, like, what's your salary? These things, they just <laughs> seem much less important when they they look at you and recognize that you're a fighter too. You're here trying to reclaim your life. Right. And nobody in that context is looking at you and going, well, you don't look disabled. Right. Right. And that's, that's another thing from the outside because when you have a stroke, a lot of it is invisible and I was young and physically fit. So it just made no sense for people to people who hadn't experienced other folks who were impacted by trauma. It just didn't make sense to them to look at me be wheeled into that rehab facility. The ones who just hadn't really been affected by trauma that same way probably couldn't tell. It just didn't fit. Do you have a favorite memory from your time in rehab? I think it was the goal setting. I was wheeled in on a stretcher uh, and then transferred. uh, Maybe on on some of the earlier days, I was able to get into a wheelchair, but being able to goal set with my nurses and the doctors there, it was great that they came in and spoke to me just like a person. You know, I wasn't a victim and it helped me to never think of myself as a victim because I'm like, I'm I'm in this situation. I've got a set of choices to make going forward. I survived for a reason and now I get to work on what that reason is. So uh, I think goal setting was one of my favorite memories because I had just decided um, my toes were beginning to move on my left foot and I was going to be walking out. I wanted no assistance tools if I could help it. You know, I was in a position to make gains or make progress 
in the rehab facility a little faster than I think a lot of patients would. And so when we were discussing, like, will it be the wheelchair, the walker, the cane? Like from the beginning, I just decided that I didn't want any aids if I could help it when I left that place. Interesting. So, so what, did, what did that goal setting process look like? Uh, we wrote it down with my nurses. Uh, they come in and on your day board, they talk to you about like, okay, so what do you want to be able to do? And of course, in my mind, I'm like, I want to go all the way back to being fit, being in top shape. I don't, I really don't want to think about um, anything that feels like it's taken away from my independence. And that, that is a part of the grieving process is looking at things that you are not able to do and trying to process them is just challenges and not saying that, okay, this is a part of me that's gone and lost. You know, it's, it's hard not to get swept up in that, but looking at that day board every day, knowing what my goal was to walk meant that I could approach each uh, like rehab, each modality, like each day we'd go and we would, start trying to do yoga in the wheelchair. We eventually, once I was able to stand, we started walking in the, uh, like the parallel bars. So every day the goal was the same, was to walk out of there. But that the, the day-to-day part of that meant a lot of mental work because I could only, I was so exhausted at the end of those days, I could only physically work for very brief periods at a time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's one of those things that, you know, you don't think about and that, I I never really encountered until going into going until going into rehab was that whole idea of you know this 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 fundamental difference between the the physical muscle fatigue from when I would try to do physical things pre-stroke to the neuro fatigue that is so different where after five steps my muscles are fine but my brain just is so exhausted from trying to make them work it's it's so different it is it's tough to describe that to people like I'm like, I don't know, imagine if you had to like cram for whatever incredible standard, standardized test that you could take, like you had to do that all day and then you had to do something physically strenuous and then have your body cooperate with you at the end of the day. Like it's just not, my legs after afterwards, if I were still able to walk, one of my legs would just be dragging and physically like my answers were delayed. This was so early, like from the emergency room to the rehab facility, uh, everything was impacted. My decision-making would decline at the end. I was just wiped out. I was physically exhausted, mentally just didn't feel like making any more choices. Uh, the irritability is a really difficult thing. And I think that's one of the reasons I have so much respect for caretakers and mm-hmm. people that are stroke adjacent. You have to deal with people who are trying to repair themselves emotionally too. Exactly. And how uh, caregivers' lives get sort of turned upside down when all we have to do is sort of focus on, you know, surviving and you know trying to walk again where suddenly uh their lives are are questioning everything about the future because they're able to look at the bigger picture in a way that we're just not in that moment right and that's part of why i think that stroke is certainly like a family disease because uh, you go through it and the people around you are affected and that's in another way uh the person that they knew is different in a lot of ways that they can't even see so they don't know how to help um I think some of the best things that we can do uh, if you're a caretaker in the life of a survivor is to just do your best to be patient and to uh, something I've heard is to be able to separate your journey from the journey of a survivor. And that is to still be there for them, but to recognize that you're not to just be independent from their walk, you know, like allowing them time to recover. And as a survivor, I know that it is very straightforward. It's very hard but my, my sole focus was to walk and to get back to an independent life. But as a caretaker, you've got to be thinking about how to show this person affection, how to teach them that they are still worthy of affection, and how to just feel close to someone who is struggling to feel close to their own identity. And still take care of yourself, too. It's that right, whole exactly. airline emergency briefing of you got to put your own uh, oxygen mask on before uh, helping others. So one of the things you've, you've written about before— uh, in the uh, the blog over at, at the Stromies, and you know, I t- had them on the show about a year ago, and the the Stromies are fantastic. But you you've written specifically about some of the challenges stroke has about your sense of self. Uh, could you talk about that a little bit? Physically going through a stroke, it feels um, like in the moment it feels as if you're dying. Uh, I was conscious throughout my entire stroke, and like I can never be rid of the memory of like 
lying on my parents' kitchen floor, uh, listening to my brother's instructions and trying to move my limbs. But I could see my body as if I was seeing someone else's. I had so little control. I was so detached. It was, I just, it's just strange to try and describe the experience of being not in the room, in your body, but in the room with your body. Like I was just another spectator at that point. Mm -hmm. And to feel that sense of spectating on your own life to some degree is really, really tough. And it's incredibly isolating and it's, it makes it difficult to talk to people because you're not sure if they can relate to that. So whatever you could do before that you can't now or that you're struggling to do feels like who you were. You're struggling to, to be who you were rather than to just do this thing. It's, it, it makes you question that, like, will I ever be this person if I cannot do what this person could do? How do you think of yourself then as a person and the nature of who you are today? Uh, I think a big part of it is what I get from my community and my family. Um, I look at them and they remind me of my worth so often that uh, it makes me see that I am still who I was like I've grown and my perspective has shifted so much, but I am still just as worthy as uh, as I've ever been. Um, I can still feel a sense of contribution to the relationships that I take part in. Uh, when I go to work, I know that I can show up and the things that are beyond my control are just simply beyond my control, but I can be on time. I can be committed to the tasks in front of me and I can just do my best to, I don't know, just be as sincere as I can in, in those relationships that helps me feel a sense of myself, a sense of my worth um, is just to be, to take what I experienced and to look at, uh, to know that I, I was blessed to survive. And um, I, I say that what a survivor gets to do is to live in the grace that a stroke provides. So the things that seem small in the face of stroke, they're, they're small all throughout life. And, I see that now. I am a bit more empathetic to other people. Um, I understand that everybody struggles through something, and our struggles, they vary by degree and not by kind. So, so I think on those things much, much more now, uh, now that I've endured a stroke, uh, now that I've been allowed to endure a stroke. Well, I think that phrase that you just used, the grace that a stroke provides, I think that's a really interesting way of looking at things and the lessons that you can take from it. Uh, so there's this, this figure, a thought leader, I don't know what else to describe him, <clears throat> how else to describe him, but uh, his name's Ram Das, who also experienced a stroke. And it's just a thing that he says about the favor that we receive. And uh, as a person of faith, I know that grace is unmerited favor. And I really could not have earned, there's nothing I, I have done with my life to earn the perspective that I was given through having had a stroke. Interesting. Interesting. The other thing that you talked about there that I also think is really valuable for folks that have been able to live with the grace of the stroke, uh, the grace that stroke provides, or really for folks that haven't been through that sort of experience, is you talk about the things that you can do. You can focus on doing your best. You can focus on being on time. And it seems like there's a, there's a real lesson in there about focusing on the things that are within your control and not worrying as much about the things that are out of your control. Yeah, and I think that that's attached to the humbling nature of a stroke. Uh, as a physically fit person, I'm a fairly strong person, maybe above average, but like being in the space of a stroke, you can't really tough it out. There's not a thing you can do. You can't flex your way out of a brain injury. So lying there in the kitchen on my parents' floor, awake, still thinking about the temperature of like the tile, I couldn't, could not lift myself out of that thing. So I was just spectating on my own life and it helps you to see things in a way that you wouldn't otherwise. Like you just, you can appreciate that there are things beyond your control and that you have to step back sometimes and know how to make a strategic withdrawal mm. from being emotionally invested in those things because they're beyond your control. Yeah. There comes a point where you just have to surrender to the experience. Yeah, exactly. You, you've also talked about the contributions that, that you want to make and that you're able to make. And you've been doing a lot of stroke awareness work on Instagram. So, I mean, how does that sort of fit in with your goals and, and what you want to accomplish? 
uh, it's, it's kind of right in that direction. I just want to connect more with people, people who've experienced stroke. They are people first, and stroke is just a part of their experience. It's just a chapter in their story. And so I love being able to connect with people to better understand their experiences. Because although I've had a stroke, like I don't know the full breadth of what a stroke survivor goes through. Like it, it could be so many different things for so many different folks who lead all kinds of different lifestyles. I say that there are infants and children, men and women, uh, young folks, older people, some folks who've been sedentary, others who've been very fit, who could be impacted by a stroke. And so this utility lets me reach out to people that I might not have otherwise encountered um, and to also bring awareness to some people who don't know that their story is being told somewhere, they might feel isolated, but what I can do is bring awareness to a story that they might not otherwise see being told and also share with people that are, again, stroke adjacent. They're living with folks who are affected by stroke or affected by another kind of trauma, and they're not sure how to interact with those people. I mean, the people I've been able to connect with are, are folks I never would have otherwise connected with just because my the path of my life would not have aligned with uh, whether that's going to be the, uh, you know, the Stromies at, in Nebraska or Ms. Wheelchair USA out of Georgia or authors out of Chicago and, and L.A. and the Bay Area. And it's ju it's just amazing how it affords those connections through that one thing that we're all bonded by, that that one common thread that that we face. Right. And there is definitely that's the the stroke of brilliance of having endured this thing, this awful thing where they're suffering. There is humanity because there is no that's the most human thing we can do. All people go through some form of suffering. It, it, it's different for each of us because we come from different backgrounds and different sets of experiences. But to suffer is the most human thing we can do. But there are definitely so many examples of people who do just remarkable things in the face of some some very tall odds that definitely inspire me and keep me, they keep me grounded. Like they keep, I have such great perspective because of what they're able to do. So, so what's next for you? Um, I want to continue to reach out to other survivors and I want to do more community things. Um, I will definitely be in touch with the stroke comeback center in Northern Virginia because uh, they're pretty local for me. Um, they're again, doing awesome things and really emphasizing that sense of community. Um, I'm going to continue to expand my writing about the experiences of a stroke survivor and um, just the human parts of the story, because I do think there is something in having endured a stroke uh, that is, it's timeless and it's classic. It's just a thing that there are things to understand for all people just out of this one experience. So, so, so you're getting married. That's correct. Oh, uh, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. And uh, it, did, so did you meet your fiancé before the stroke or, or after? I did. We were together, actually, uh, throughout my, throughout, well, for years before I had a stroke. And um, she's been with me ever since. And that's, that's really been a blessing because it's a lot to go through. Um, uh, as someone who cares for a person that's enduring a stroke. So that's been pretty amazing to have her with me. So, so Vince, if folks want to know more about you and what you're up to, where should they go? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm definitely on social media. Obviously, the one that is that I'm most active on, of course, is Instagram. Uh, you can find me at Vince.856 or over on Twitter and Snapchat at Vince underscore 856. Uh, look forward to a blog coming out in the coming months. Um, but yeah, that's where I'm at now. Awesome. And we're going to have all of those links available over at strokecast.com slash Vince. Awesome. And I want to remind everyone to... Seek yourself out in the world. Uh, what happens a lot of times when we hear things like you're not special is that we think that we are not important, but you absolutely are. Um, so if you can tell your story, you might be writing a survival guide for somebody else. Well, that is fantastic. So Vince, thank you so much for joining us here on StrokeCast this week. Bill, thank you so much for having me. There are three key things I really want to call out from this episode and, and just sort of reemphasize them. First, if you suspect someone is having a stroke or you might be having a stroke, call an ambulance. Do not drive yourself or the other person to the hospital. Because even if you think an ambulance might take longer, remember that triage will happen in that ambulance. And treatment can start in that ambulance. 
And then when you get to the ER, you don't have to start triage there in the main room surrounded by all the other patients. In many cases, you can zip right on through and really take advantage of all the time that you need. Also, if you call an ambulance, they can actually drive you or the person having the stroke that you called about to the right hospital and avoid wasting time going to a hospital that may not be able to treat the stroke properly or promptly. Second thing I want to emphasize is that there is tremendous power in goal setting. Vince talked about how valuable goals were for his recovery and how they can still support it. You see, goal setting has been a big theme of the show recently, and that wasn't even necessarily the plan to put together a whole bunch of episodes about goals, but it just sort of came up that way. I mean, it came up last week when I talked with restorative therapies about how their gear can measure our progress towards our goals, and a few weeks ago when I talked about both the importance of the quantified self and how to set SMART goals. So goal setting is not something to be skipped over. It's something that's very important and can absolutely be helpful in our recoveries. Finally, Vince talked about the grace of the stroke. It's an odd phrase, isn't it? But it's not terribly uncommon either. A lot of stroke survivors say they feel lucky. Joe from the NeuroNerds talked about his stroke as a blessing. Jan Douglas named her book a wonderful stroke of luck. And in Tell Me Everything You Don't Remember, Christine Lee said about her stroke that she learned to accept that bad events do not have to remain bad events. As I say, it's not an uncommon refrain, though I I know many survivors don't feel the same way. The point is, good can come from this trauma. Hope can come from this trauma. A new life can come from this trauma. No one is recommending that someone go out and have a stroke to improve their lives, of course. That would be an absolutely terrible idea. But once we've been through this maelstrom, we have to stop and ask, what now? What do I do with this new life I have ahead of me? What can I learn and grow from this? What can I learn and how can I grow from this? And how can I live my best life going forward? And that brings us to our hack of the week. For me, the big ones have been the things that have helped me manage my memory. So that means the sticky notes, the alarms, the reminders, the uh, appointment uh, indicators, anything that helps me to just stay more on task and to keep management of my life, to find some structure. Like that helps me get a sense of normalcy. So whatever planner people can use, I would definitely implore them to to make that a part of their daily life. Uh, It can feel like a crutch at first. But honestly, if you know yourself well enough to make those accommodations, what you're doing is pretty ingenious, actually. I don't, I don't think of it as a crutch. <laughs> Absolutely. And a crutch is a freeing device. You it know? is. It really is. <laughs> uh, yeah, I felt that a lot in the beginning of my recovery, and there is no shame in that. And um, whatever it is that we can do to make a fuller life more accessible to us is perfectly acceptable. Ooh, I use, like, the native notes app on my phone. Uh-huh. Um, and, of course, I use, like, I have an Android phone, so I do use the Google Assistant to set up reminders for podcasts or doctor's appointments or uh, when I'm supposed to be sending out invitations for my upcoming wedding, um, things like that. So check out Vince's Instagram account and a bunch of other references in today's show over at strokecast.com slash Vince. Be sure to share this episode with a friend colleague, OT, PT, or speech therapist by giving them the link strokecast.com slash Vince. Follow me on Instagram at strokecast.com slash Instagram. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you next week.
The Stroke cast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Stroke Cast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network. Thank you.